In this episode, which was episode 119, Jim Palmer talks about how you can create your own adventure before and during retirement. Hi, it's Kathy Klein with the Rocky Retirement Show, and I am so glad that you've decided to be with us today. Today I have Jim Palmer on the line with me, and I'm so excited that he's here today. I actually met him through his daughter, which is kind of crazy because he's closer to my age than his daughter is. (laughs) And when she told me about what he was planning on doing, I said, you know what? I have to have him on the show. And this was, I don't know, six or eight months ago. And what's funny is that I'm going to tell you a little story, but this whole thing was his wife's idea. So Jim started thinking about and living his retirement lifestyle before retirement age. Instead of waiting for his retirement, though, he's living out a dream now while he continues to work. And I'll let you Actually, I'm going to have Jim tell you what he does later on in the show. He and his wife sold their house and put the contents in storage. They're currently living on their boat, which is named Floating Home, and traveling up and down the East Coast. They're enjoying a more simple life. He's created a dream business where he works with clients only three days a week, and he travels the rest of the time. He hopes to continue working for many years beyond typical retirement age and says it'll be possible because he hasn't worn himself out with work that's unfulfilling. So, Jim, welcome to the show. Kathy, it's an honor to be on your program. Has it really been eight months since we got introduced? Something like that. It's been a while, you know, because I wanted to wait until after you'd been on the boat for a while. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because, you know, we always have this... I don't know, honeymoon phase, right? Yeah. And so I want to make s- sure we don't sink. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, there's uh, storms in the in the ocean, right? That's right. So tell me, I, I know it was your wife's idea, but you're really the boat guy, right? I, I grew up on boats, my family, my grandparents, my brother, my dad. And then um, when Stephanie and I got married, I said, I'm going to have my own boat. And then we had first of four kids and <laughs> next thing you know, we're raising four kids and all that goes with that money wise. And, um, but then once the kids got married and moved on and Stephanie was, uh, very much into uh, her career in early childhood development in the, in the last few years, it just gotten really stressful with bureaucracy and stuff like that. And eventually she said, you know, I'm, I'm done with this job. And she, she never used the words retirement, but we got to see what's next. So she, when she quit that job, because I, I'm a business coach and I can do my job anywhere. I have a phone and internet. We suddenly were not landlocked, so to speak, to the to to where we lived in our home. And she said, it's time for a big adventure. And I'm like, what do you have in mind? (laughs) And we're like binge watching HGTV, Caribbean lifestyle. Should we go live in the Caribbean? Should we do this, that, and other thing? And meanwhile, three years earlier, we bought our first boat and we just every weekend was down there. It was a 30 foot boat, so big enough to sleep on, but not live full time. But we eventually she said, what if we lived on a boat? And of course, my next comment was that movie line from Jaws. Well, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then we set into motion, you know, selling the house. And I, we kind of agreed that um, what I know about marketing, we'd try and put that to use and see if we could sell it ourselves and save a lot of commission. And we did that. And then we found the perfect boat. And there we are. We moved on April. I think it was April 15th of, of last year. Wow. And tax so day. Yeah, I know. Tax day. And yeah, no more real estate taxes. <laughs> We're also, uh, we became Florida residents and so no more income, to pers- at least state income tax. And, we, you know, Kathy, we agreed to an 18 month plan. We've said what we're going to do is first summer, go up to New England where Jessica and our two grandkids live. And then we'll come back for a little bit on the Chesapeake Bay, which is our home port. Then we're going to go to Florida for the winter, which is this winter. And, and then we'll come back up to Chesapeake Bay and we'll figure out what we want to do after that. And the bottom line is we love this so much. You mentioned it's just a simple, relaxing, like it feels like we're on vacation literally every day. So we're we're talking about a five-year plan and who knows, it could go longer than that. Wow. Okay. So my ne- now I'm not a big, I, I love being on a boat, mm-hmm. but I don't know that much about them. I mean, I know how okay. to sail, but if you say I have a 30-foot 
boat. I know 50 feet is bigger than that, but how like, to me, a boat is kind of like an RV, mm-hmm. right? So how big is the boat that you live on now? It's pretty big. It's 50 feet long by 14 and a half feet wide. It's two bedrooms, two baths. It's got almost a thousand horsepower. It's not a sailboat. It's a motor, it's a book called a motor yacht. And, um, you know, we can drive up top. We're about 20 feet up in the air up there. And it's very, very comfortable. We didn't, we didn't want to go camping on the water and we wanted to be really comfortable. And because I still work on the boat, we didn't want to have just one big living area where she could never get away from me and hearing me yak on the phone all the time. And (laughs) so she can go in a room, she can go upstairs, she can take walks and, you know, she does a lot of different things, but, um, so we, we fell in love with this boat and that's ultimately the one that we uh, decided to get. So you got two bedrooms. Do you use one of them as an office or is it for you each have your own bedroom? How does that work? It, the front is called a V berth. So it's not huge. It's not like walk around. There's a bed up there. It's the size of a double bed. There's a couple small closets. There is a, a bathroom and a shower in the front of the boat that could be if we had guests. Right now, we got suitcases, an extra chair. We got a bunch of food up there. That's our big storage unit <laughs> on the boat. We seldom have have uh, sleepover guests. And so in the main salon, we have – it's kind of a small living room. On one side is a couch, which converts to a bed also. And on the other side uh, is my desk. We had to take out two chairs, two sitting chairs to make room for my desk. And we have a small galley, which is kitchen, boat, and boat language. And we have a um, – a dinette. And then we have what's called an aft cabin in the back where there's a big long bench seat. There's a TV, ice maker sink all up there. And uh, then we have a giant swim platform. So there's a lot of living space inside and outside. We, we, we really like boating because we want to be outside, which when the weather's really nasty and it has been nasty and we're kind of stuck inside, that's, you, you start getting a little rammy, like you just want to get out. But, um, Anyway, that just goes, that's just part of the deal. Now you have to take your boat like once or twice a year to clean the hole, right? I mean, I I do know a little bit about boats because it gets little barnacles on there. It can, you know, it depends. And so there's different, it's called bottom paint. And the people we bought the boat from took really great care of it. We, we act, what's called a short haul. So you bring it over and they put it in that giant crane and they pull it out of the water. We did a short haul in October before we left the Chesapeake Bay to come to Florida and everything was fine. We actually had the boat pulled out of the water again two weeks ago because we had to have a repair below the water line. Mm -hmm. So we got to look at everything. It's fine. So yeah, we're, we're not, if you leave a boat sit, that's the other thing. If you just leave a boat stationary, that's when you're going to just get a bunch of stuff under there, a lot of growth and crustaceans and things like that. But we actually take our boat out and and we use it. I mean, from the time we left on October 30th, we were in motion until uh, probably the last time we weren't in motion was January 1st when we got to where we are now in Jacksonville, Florida. The boat didn't leave the slip for about three weeks or four weeks. And then we took it out after that. Okay. So it does sound a little similar to living in an RV, but maybe you have more room. Is that correct? Well, I've seen some RVs that probably bigger than this, but they're <laughs> ginormous. It just depends on on really what you need, Kathy. And sometimes when you're looking and, you know, to reference back to HTV, you see these people, oh, we can have our friends over and we'll party. Well, how often does that really happen? I know. You know? I and totally so know. <laughs> it's really not. So, I mean, this is such a great size boat for the two of us. And, you know, when we love having our grandkids, our grandkids take over the front bedroom and two of them sleep up there. It's it, I can imagine how much fun they're having. (laughs) If I got to do that when I was a kid, I I think I'd remember that pretty well. But so it's, it's more, it's more than we don't need anything bigger. You know, sometimes go, well, I'd like a bigger boat. And we certainly did when we had our 30 foot, but I can't imagine getting a boat bigger than 50 feet. It's probably not practical. Okay. And obviously you have a captain's license. You actually don't have a captain's license. Oh, you don't. The fact that you own a boat and can drive a boat, you're a captain. Now I have taken, Stephanie and I have both taken courses through the Coast Guard. And, you know, my job is to drive the boat and do some of the mechanical maintenance. And her job primarily is the navigator. So she actually took a multi-day course through um, the Annapolis School of Seamanship on how to plot your course and do all different things like that. And she actually graduated from a Coast Guard boating class. So you never stop learning because things that happen out in the sea generally happen pretty quickly and unexpectedly. And the more uh, the more trained you are, you know, the, the more able you are to uh, handle something like that. Hmm. Have you ever had an emergency at sea? 
we haven't had an emergency, but we've had some pretty scary times. When we left, when we um, moved on the boat <clears throat> on April 15th, and we were on it for about two weeks at our home port, and then we, we left to drive to Rhode Island. And up to that point, Kathy, the furthest we drove our, our sea ray was about two hours. That was a long trip for us. And we were embarking on a multi-day trip up to Rhode Island, which had us going up the Jersey coast through through New York City, past the Statue of Liberty, out the East River. We've never done anything like that. And we're, we laugh now because it's like, how did we get through that? Well, I guess <laughs> we just did. But we were going up the coast and it was a pretty nice day. And the closer we got to the tip of New Jersey, where you're in this kind of open ocean before you then get into the uh, New York Harbor, which you're greeted by the Statue of Liberty, which is very cool, gave us both shivers. Mm. But all of a sudden, the water just got really choppy. And, and to me, I'm like, man, we're on a 50 foot boat. It's like, 42,000 pounds. We got a thousand horsepower. This is nothing. Well, you very quickly feel like a cork in the washing machine on spin cycle. <laughs> okay. And water is like coming over the bow. And like I said, when we drive it up top, we're, we're about 20 feet up in the air and the water is coming that high over our windshield. And it's mm. like, holy moly, the inside of the boat in the cabin looked like a tornado went through it. So we really you know, I don't know, batten down the hatches. We put everything that's loose away before we leave the slip now. And, but somehow we did it. I mean, we got up to Rhode Island and, and we pulled in that slip. I got off the boat and I kissed the dock. I said, we're not leaving here for a month, <laughs> <laughs> but we made it. Thank you, Lord, for getting me through this. Oh, exactly. There was a lot of that. <laughs> okay. So we are going to go on a break soon, but before we go on the break, I want you to tell me what has been the best moment so far of living on your boat? The best moment so far? Gosh, I, I would I would instantly say pulling into New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty from the water on our own boat. But the other thing was when we saw the grandkids come running down the dock and that I don't know, that would that would be a tough one for me to to I'd probably have to go with the grandkids because it'd be the right thing to say. But you know, <laughs> and they they spent the night it was just and the other thing, which is really good, if I can say one more best thing, was that Stephanie and I have really learned uh, because of necessity to communicate better and work together. Driving a boat like this is not a one-person job. We have to coordinate. When I'm pulling into the marina, I'm looking at flags. I'm assessing the current. I know which way we're going to be blown. I know I tell her what side to put the fenders on. She gets the lines ready. I tell her what we're going to put on first. And, and we communicate via headsets because the boat's so big, you know, we'd have to holler at each other. And so it's it's really actually been very, very good for our relationship. Wow. You know, it's funny because a situation like that can either – draw you closer or push you away. It, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like it's drawing you closer. It really is. And, you know, sadly, we know so many people that once the kids kind of move out and you know, empty house syndrome, well, sadly, a lot of marriages fall apart. But, you know, we've always really enjoyed just being spending time together and, and, um, and it, which is good because we're on the boat 24 seven. Right. You, you know? can't really leave no. if I you get mad. I just go over here and go to work. Exactly. <laughs> well, when we come back from the break, I'm going to ask you what your worst moment has been. I know my listeners are probably at the edge of their seat. So okay. thank you. And we will be right back after these messages. Want to support the show? I do this show as a love project for you, the listener, but I have expenses. I have to pay for the hosting of this show every month. There's also the creation of the show notes. There's the editing, because I certainly can't do that myself. So I've created a place where you can go to support the show for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to rockyourretirement.com slash support and select your level of support. It would mean the world to me. Welcome back to the Rock Your Retirement Show. I am here with Jim Palmer, and he's telling me about the experiences that he's had once he, I don't want to say he's retired, but he decided to go live on a boat with his wife, and he just told us some of the best experiences, and now he's going to tell us the worst. So, Jim, welcome back. Okay, thanks. Boy, I'm going to have to 
I wrote down two or three real quick. So, but then one popped into. So we're off the coast of New Jersey, coming back down in uh, September. We're headed out of Rhode Island. We're on the way back to the Chesapeake Bay, where we'll stay for a month before heading. You know, waiting for actually hurricane season to end before we head south. And we're off the coast of Atlantic City, and one of the engines went down, and we're in like three to four foot seas, which when you're moving is not a big deal. We're kind of rolling up and down, but all of a sudden, an engine went down, and when you stop moving and the boat is just lifting left and right, front and back, and, you know, almost I started getting uh, nauseous, and I thought, I got to go into the engine room, and that's really bad when you're nauseous. You always want to keep your eyes out on the horizon. When I went down into the engine room where I couldn't see, I got really violently sick. But then we had to end up calling CETO, which is a company that, you know, it's like insurance. They come out and tow you into port. And um, as sick as I was, I had to go out on the front of the, on the bow, on the front of the boat and catch a line from the CETO boat and attach it to the two cleats on the front so he could tow us in. And I'm like, I'm sick. I'm afraid I'm going to fall off because the boat is rocking so violently. <laughs> and I kept missing the rope. Eventually, we got it, and he pulled us in. An hour later, we were safely tied at the dock, and I started started coming around and feeling human again. But that was a pretty scary moment. Mm, I bet it was. Now, have you been into the deep sea at all, or are you always sort of off the coast? It's a combination of what's called the intercoastal waterway. And then we also go out to sea when we want to make good time. So we, when we go out to sea, we're generally about three miles off the coast. And that is anywhere from 80 to 100 feet of water. Um, it's different in different places, but that's pretty deep. So that's, that's about as far as we go. There's no reason to go out farther, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, if it's not like you want to travel from here to, I don't know, Japan, right? <laughs> no, I couldn't do that. I don't hold. An, I I hold five hundred eighty gallons of fuel, but that's not going to get us to Japan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've had some good experiences. You've had some, you know, at least one bad experience. Sounds like a couple. What was the most surprising thing that you have found so far that relates to living on? your boat. We have discovered through our journeys and and living on the boat and meeting other boat people at marinas and stuff, we have discovered that this, it's kind of weird. I don't know how to put this, but there is hope for humanity. (laughs) Like we get sometimes when we're in our home and in this very crowded area of uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, and there's just so much going on. There's building, there's yakking, there's politics and all this and that. And sometimes you, you, you lose sight. Like you could be walking down the street and you say hi to somebody and they're like looking at their phone. They don't even acknowledge you. And what we found out, especially on the intercoastal waterway, Kathy, when we're stopping at different small towns, because that's really what's along the waterway, our very, we call it small town America. You say hi to some, you dock your boat and you kind of take a walk into town and you say hi to somebody and they actually look you in the eye and say, hey, how are you? Are you new here? Oh, nice dog. We hope you have a nice day. And they're looking at you. And it's like, it's really um People will loan you their car, whether it's a marina what? or people. I'm not kidding, Kathy. Wait. That actually happened. Yep. No way. Tell me this story. So when you go to different marinas, sometimes they'll have a loaner car. And um, when we pulled into this little town in North Carolina, we got there and the marina was closed. So I just asked somebody on the street, do you know if the marina has a loaner card when you, to get some groceries? They said, I don't think they do, but you could ask anybody in town. <laughs> they'll either loan you or take you to the grocery store. It's not that far. And it was like. This was a small town, Kathy, where there was actually a pharmacy with a soda stand. I mean, it was like <laughs> it could have been Mayberry. Oh, my goodness. But, the, but we discovered half a dozen of those towns. And the further south we came, I mean, it's just like people are, are so nice and they generally want to talk to you and, and boating people. It doesn't matter if you're a sailboater or a power boater, if you're like a boater like, and people just want to take care of each other, help each other. Hey, I, I know something about electronics. I know something about mechanics, but whatever people generally help each other. And it's kind of re- restored our faith a little bit in humanity. Not that we were, you know, Oh my God, the world's going to hell, nothing like that. But it's just, we're really seeing a different side the last year or so. That is very uplifting. Thank you. I mean, because with everything that's going on in the world right now, and you know, this is an evergreen show, so we usually don't talk about specifics, mm-hmm. but it does get a little disheartening. You know, it's like, oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I hope yeah. I yeah. So it, that is good to know, and it's it's good to know that humanity is still alive and well 
We just don't necessarily hear it on the news. Right. And you know what's interesting about that is when we first moved on the boat, we had put the boat in a, a marina that had a, a covered shed for the winter. So there's a big metal roof over the boat. And when we first moved on, the, the satellite TV didn't work. So for the first couple of weeks, we had zero TV and we didn't miss it at all. And then when we started traveling, of course, we were too tired at night. We'd pull into a marina and have a little dinner, go to bed and get up early and start moving again. And it was it was funny. We went for about three or four weeks with almost no TV and neither of us missed it. And we said, well, we we wake up and if it's early enough, we watch the sun come up and then we'll watch the sun go down. And at night, especially when it's warm, we'll sit up on the on the back deck and we'll just look at boats coming and going. And it's like, this is reality TV. And so we don't miss TV. And The reason I share that with you is because no TV, we're just very removed or I'm not going to say where heads are in the sand, but we're very removed from all the noise that used to be part of our life. You know, one of the things that my pastor says is that sometimes you just have to disconnect, like don't listen to the radio news, don't listen to the TV news, you know, get off Facebook and just reconnect with humans because all of that. It, there's never good stuff. You know, they're not, they're not telling you all the good things that, that are happening They're, You know, they'd go out of business if all they talked about was good things, because we as humans, we're sort of drawn to what's bad, right? <laughs> it's funny because that is their business, which is ratings. And instinctively, I think we know that yet when there's something big going on, we go, well, I got to see what's going on. or I want to hear this. And then you got two, two people yakking at each other and it's just like, ugh. Next thing you know, you waste an hour and you're agitated. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. You get really agitated. I mean, myself, I have basically turned off Facebook. I mean, I have to go on every now and then, but I don't have it on my phone. Well, I take that back. I can access it on my phone, but everything's turned off. Like I don't get any, right? no noise, you know, telling me when somebody has posted something or liked my post. In a way, I feel like maybe my friends think I don't like them. But on the other hand, I'd rather just talk to them personally, either on the phone or in person, you know, rather than the whole Facebook thing. Although, right? I, I mean, we'll see what happens with Facebook. For me, it used to be a lot more fun. Now it's, it did. Yeah. Now it seems to be, I don't know. I don't want to say Facebook is evil, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, through my kids, we found out there's, there's different apps. Like my parents would never go on Facebook. They, they think it is evil <laughs> or they just don't want to do it. But there's a program called 23 snaps and um, it's just people that you connect in your family. So like, Jessica and her twin sister, Amanda, has um, a little boy. And all the pictures they snap, they just put on 23 snaps because they don't want their kids on on social media. And like my parents who are still with us, they're in Orlando, Florida, they get to see these great grandkids growing up. So there are some things if you want to stay connected with your family, right, there are things that you can do to do that without putting it out there for the world to see. Yeah, that that's true. And some things you don't really care of the way. Like for me, I'm not really putting anything out there that I don't want other people to see. It's just all the noise. Like you said, there's a Mm -hmm. lot of noise out there. Thank goodness I started un... I don't know what you call it because I'm not unliking my friends, but if they post something political, I would just say, I don't want to see this. Now I don't get any politics for, from anyone, like no politics from the right, the left, the, the center. Yep. Uh, I this post and they, and they somehow, they, then after a while they get to know, I don't want to see that. I don't yeah. agree with that. <laughs> no, no, it's not my friends that know that it's um, Facebook. Yep. Their algorithms like, well, she doesn't want to see anything political. So they don't show me anything political anymore. It's right. really kind of awesome. Okay. Now I have a huge question for you. Okay. And that is, how did you know how to do this? Did you read about how to live on a boat? Did you, did you just say, oh, it's, you know, like living on a house. It's small. Like I would have (laughs) no idea how to live on a boat. Well, when we decided to do this, Stephanie and I both started reading a lot of books from people who have done it, pros and cons, things to learn, et cetera. But you know, besides being a business coach, I'm an author. I've written seven books. My seventh book I wrote 
based a little bit on this experience, although I always tie it back to business, but the book is called Just Say Yes. <laughs> Sometimes when you're when you're getting ready to do something big, and I would think selling your house and moving on a boat is pretty darn big, your mind starts playing the what if game. Well, what if I run aground? What if I run out of fuel? You know, what if I hit something? What if I cause damage? And all these things, scenarios go in your head. And sometimes the what if game can can paralyze you with fear like you're going to not do things. Interestingly enough, I one of the books that I read after we agreed we're going to do this, but then, you know, every day you start thinking, hmm, is this really the smart thing to do with, with a good <laughs> chunk of retirement money? A boat is not exactly a wise investment in anybody's dictionary, right? And so you're thinking all these different thoughts, including the ones I just shared. But I was reading this book about this guy who was a musician and he lived on a sailboat. And he kind of said, listen, if you're thinking about it, you're probably thinking about a lot of things that can go wrong. And he said, yeah, but what if you do find out that you're really you're really a great boat driver and you go and have the adventure of a lifetime? All the things you worried about don't happen. And it's just amazing. And you would never have this amazing experience and adventure in your life if you don't first just say yes or say yes. I don't know who said that first, but, and that was, that was really something that now the interesting thing is Kathy, I have run aground twice. I did run out of fuel. I, I bumped into the dock on a windy day and caused $800 of damage to my, I've done a lot of things that I was worried about, but as, um, Stephanie writes most of our blog about our experiences. And the other day she wrote something and said, as Jim would say, we haven't sunk yet. So <laughs> we're, we're still going. Wow. Oh, you know, I wasn't even thinking of the cost. Now I have a wide audience. Some of mm -hmm. them are, they don't have any money and they're trying to figure out if they should move to Costa Rica or Mexico or something so they can just survive on social security. Right. And then I have other guests that are on the upper end. Now, I'm assuming that since you have a yacht, you're on the upper end. So if somebody doesn't have a ton of I mean, I have no idea how much you've spent on your yacht. I'm assuming it's about the price of a house in the Midwest. That's fair. Maybe not in California where I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you basically sell your house and used those proceeds to buy the yes. boat? Okay, so you yes. weren't really digging into your... IRAs no, or 401k. But here's the thing. If there are people who move on to boats, there's it's it's quite popular, especially with well, all age groups actually. We've met like people older than us and younger people to move on to a sailboat because a lot of those people want to quote unquote get off the grid. So mm -hmm. you know, you on a sailboat you're using far less fuel than we use because this uses a lot of fuel. And if there's wind, you go out there and just power by the wind, they put solar panels on their boat and they use far less electricity and things. So there's different ways to do it. Um, there's also, when you think about it, there are there can be, and very often are, major expenses as it comes to repairs. We just spent 2,500 bucks we didn't plan on because we had to repair something. That's what I mentioned. You know, we had to come out of the water a couple of weeks ago. But by and large, we also no longer have you know real estate taxes. I don't have lawn care and you know uh, snow blower and all the yard stuff and all the other things that go with a home. So with everything being equal, if things are going al along on a good track, living on a boat has the potential to be less expensive than living in a home. Now, when that's not true is when we're traveling. And again, we're on a 50 foot boat with two big diesel motors. So if we were sailing and traveling, not a lot of cost there. You're driven by the wind. For us, we burn about 36 gallons an hour, so it's quite costly. That's just the lifestyle we want to have right now. Eventually, we'll probably not do that anymore, <laughs> but still living on the boat. And we also know people who buy uh, old boats, like a 1980 boat for maybe $10,000, and they fix it up themselves. There's, You could do that. I have a friend that did that. They have a wooden boat. Yeah. And I didn't want to spend two years fixing things up myself. I, I would rather just buy something that is ready to go. And that was our choice. But there's a lot of different ways you can do it, Kathy. And, and you know, w one of the things to think about is is really the safety factor is learning how to drive the boat, learning about the winds and the currents and when it's safe to go out, obviously learning how to read chart plotters. And there's, there is so much to learn. And, you know, one of Stephanie's blog posts was we were supposed to leave this marina and, and do another four to five hours to keep moving south. And the wind and the weather was going to be unpredictable. 
and we're thinking, well, by 11 a.m., we would like to usually get on the on the road, so to speak, by 9 a.m. And, well, it's too windy. It's like 20 knot winds. And our boat is so tall, it, it kind of takes on like a, a kite. Mm-hmm. It'll blow us sideways unless we're really moving. And you can't move when you're in a marina. That's when it gets really dangerous. So, mm-hmm. well, if we if we leave by 11 and it calms down, but and we have apps for wind, we have apps for offshore weather, onshore weather, tide charts, all these different things go into whether or not we decide to go out. And so a lot of it is studying and getting knowledge, but a lot of it is just experience and and knowing what you're capable of handling. I, for one, am not afraid to get off my boat and I'll walk up and down the dock and I'll talk to other captains to see maybe they're more experienced. If somebody says, I ain't going out, well, okay, maybe I better follow his lead, you know, if he's been doing this for 10 years. So I'm not afraid to seek other people's opinions so I can make a really, really informed decision and, and keep us safe. And that's, that's great. How long do you think, I mean, are you going to do this till you die? Or is it going to be, mm, I'll probably do it till I'm 80 or until I, you know. A lot of it has to do, obviously, with our health. You know, Stephanie's dad bought a sailboat when he was 75. And, you know, for five or six years, he was pretty good. And then as his health started to deteriorate, not mentally, but his body started, you know, wearing out a little bit, it was getting harder to safely get on and off the boat. And at some point, you know, when it's time. But I mean, we're not thinking that far into the future. I mean, yeah, you only have five years and then you'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And the, the, when it ceases to become fun, or we feel really compelled to move back on into a house somewhere. I don't, I don't know if that'll happen or we'll just rent or go. I don't know what we'll do. But right now, there's a lot more that we want to see. There's something called the Great Loop, by the way, where you can circumnavigate on water the entire East Coast, go up the Mississippi River, go up through Chicago, up through the Great Lakes, around Canada, come down through New York. You can go all around. It's called the Great Loop. That takes about a year to do. We would possibly like to do that. I mean, you see parts of this country that you don't see when you're on I-95 or pick any other major traveling route by car. And we get to experience so much. And really what caused both of us to ultimately just say yes is we didn't want to be sitting in a rocking chair when you're 80 or 85 or 90, whenever that happens and go, God, I wish we did that. We so should have done that. It. We're doing it. Why didn't we do it? Okay. So you are still working. How do you get internet, uh, you know, or telephone service? Do you have to have a satellite? Yeah, that's our greatest challenge right now. I can solve it at different times, depending on how long we're going to be in one marina. Like right now, we're in this marina in Jacksonville, Florida for three months. And this marina happens to be wired by Comcast. And you get your own account and they come out and I actually have good internet here. But there's plenty of marinas where it's very sketchy. And so the, some of my clients that like to do video conferencing, I have to just resort to audio because I don't have enough bandwidth. But I, I did put a, um, a cell phone antenna up on my radar art, so it's pretty high. It's got a signal booster. And we've never been without – we have Verizon for our cell phone. We've never been out of Verizon service so far. Even three miles off the coast, you still get it because it shoots pretty easily across the water. And as long as I can – my cell phone antenna up on the radar arch – can uh, pick up a signal. I have that wired down into a, a router inside the boat and that provides our Wi-Fi. And there's these little thing called hotspots. They're called Verizon jet packs. I actually have three of them because you can only get like 20 megs a month. And believe me, you can shoot through 20 megs pretty quickly. <laughs> so I have three of those. Of course, we have the data that comes with each of our cell phones. So we can use our cell phones as hotspots. But at this marina, and then when we spent the summer in Rhode Island last year, that was wired with uh, Cox Communication, which I guess is a Comcast competitor, and we can actually have uh, our boat is wired by the dock through through a coaxial cable. So when you're on the sea, you're on your cell phones because you're within three miles, and it usually works. Right. And when you're docked, you buy whatever service is available at the dock. Right. And most marinas have Wi-Fi available, but it's like this one. This has probably, I think, 180 boats here. And there's one Wi-Fi antenna <laughs> like on top of the office. Now, you can imagine there's 50 people trying to download Netflix or yeah, something. Yeah, forget like it. That. It gets real slow. It's so going to be I, impossible. I try and, 
I try and take care of it myself. That's just, and that's just, that is one of the expenses of living on the boat. Is the internet. Yep. But, but that is something that even when I get frustrated, okay, that's a fair trade off. Cause I look out the window, like I'm doing right now and I'm looking at the sun. I see my Eagle's flag flowing on the front of the boat. and I'm, <laughs> I'm a happy camper. <laughs> wow. That is so awesome. So I want to go back to your book, and I know we're almost out of time, but the book that you said um, that you wrote, Just Say Yes, Mm -hmm. is this a business book or would this be a book that would also appeal to some of my listeners that are thinking about retirement? It's primarily a business book. Hmm. So I did share some of the lessons that we learned as we start, as we started and completed this journey of moving on the boat, but I liken it all to the decisions you have to make as an entrepreneur. You know, you, what if this doesn't work? What if I lose some money? What if I get embarrassed? What if my book doesn't sell? You know, all the different things. And I really, I, I wrote six books, and I thought, well, I'm done. I don't feel like writing another book. And and as we went through this whole journey and this process of selling the home, and then we moved into a small one bedroom cottage in the winter while before we moved on the boat and all these different things that we had to do. I'm like, man, there's so many decisions that we're making. And there's so many, like every once in a while, like we got to think that we've been really living a safe and predictable life for a lot of, a lot of years. You know, we had the right insurances and putting away for retirement. We're playing everything by the book. And in fact, our blog, the header of our blog is from practical and predictable to adventurous and exciting. You know? <laughs> and, and that really describes our life. So especially the last several years, once the kids had moved out, and it was just the two of us and we're both working real hard. And, and it's like we've been become very predictable and we wanted to do something way outside the box. It's funny, we got two reactions when we told friends and family, neighbors that we've had for almost 30 years, you either got oh my God, what are you doing? That's crazy. Or you got, oh, that's so awesome. I could never do that, but I will live vicariously through you. <laughs> Something like that. It was either really cool or you're completely nonsensical for thinking that. You know, I I can, I know you're done writing books, but it sounds like uh, from practical and predictable to adventurous and exciting would make a great new book. Well, I, I'm trying to encourage Stephanie to consider writing a book because, like I said, she's writing most of the blog posts. She's a great storyteller. It's so one when we, we ran aground one night and it was dark, and we literally had to get the dog off the boat to go to the bathroom, and and then some people on shore they had no idea who he were. They were like, "Hey, who is that over there?" I mean, it was almost <laughs> like, "Oh God, I hope I don't hear banjo soon." You know. <laughs> And she just told it, and I said, "You could write. Just keep writing your blog. You could, you could write. You're going to write a good book someday. That, and maybe that will be the title of it." Well, that is awesome. So let the listener. We're coming up to the end of the show. Go ahead and let the listener know how to contact you or get it more information if they want to read about your adventures, where do they go? So we started a blog. The name, as you said, the name of our boat is Floating Home. So it's ourfloatinghome.com. O-U-R floatinghome.com. When you go there, obviously the blog posts filter by date, so you'll see the most recent one, but there's a tab that says the beginning or how it started, and that's the first blog post that describes some of what I've shared with you and your audience here, but it'll describe the whole thought process, what we did, and eventually how we moved on, and and um, it's it's really pretty fun to to see how we've progressed and and certainly my skill set and my comfort level of driving the boat has greatly increased from day one to now. And hopefully it'll keep going that way, but our floating home, and that's got some contact information for both of us on there. Well, that's great. Cause I have a listener who's actually been asking me to do an episode on how to figure out where to live. Maybe mm. she'll decide to live on a boat. Who knows? <laughs> well, it's, it's a pretty cool adventure. And like I said, you're going to, everybody, one thing we all have in common is we're going to, deteriorate and someday the sand will run out of the hourglass, so to speak. And, you know, we all have to decide what we want to do. And, um, you know, we can be very, very safe and just try and live miserly and make sure that money doesn't run out. I, I kind of read that on your thing. Or we can create memories, you know, and memories are something that uh, you can take with you. That's right. And so can the people that you create them with. Yes. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been great fun. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pretty cool show you're doing. Thank you. And for the listener, we'll see you next time on Rock Your Retirement. <laughs> 